when I first seen the Wizard of Oz, I was a child. And through my eyes then, I was singing this, the songs. I loved Dorothy's slippers. I was terrified of the witch. So that was my experience as a child. But when I, I look at it as an adult, you know, when the Wizard of Oz um, was launched, it had its debut in Hollywood. It was the 15th of August in 1939, so let's put that into context. It never went worldwide for another 10 days. So war was looming, and um, World War II was about to start. The media around the world was very different, so when you look at newspapers from that time, American articles were you know, very upbeat and quite uplifting, but the European news stories were particularly different. It was quite doom and gloom. So in Poland, um, for example, at that exact time, there was tanks on the border, they were goading the Polish people at the border, there was troops all waiting to, to charge in. So that's before the trains, before the smoke and before the fire. So this was all happening. Incredible really that you have The Wizard of Oz um, making its debut and being launched as a summer film in 1939 at that time. When I first started my career, it was way back in the 90s, and um, so that was basically when I, I decided I really want to help people. So I qualified as an integrative counsellor, so that's my background. And um, I started my career in the Kingdom of Fife. And at that time, there was a heroin epidemic, so I really got to cut my teeth around that time. And there was a war on drugs, and I didn't really see it because I was on the ground level, you know, inundated with referrals and people coming in. And um, at that time, I was also aware of homelessness. But what I was aware of was hostels had just started, and so was bed and breakfast as a temporary housing me measure for our homeless community. The sad thing is, you, you, you had the heroin epidemic at the same time. So you're opening these hostels, and you're putting a lot of people in them. So it took two people to have a heroin addiction, and the whole thing was swept through hostels like wildfire. From there, I, I've, I've moved to Edinburgh, and I've got the real privilege to work for a social business you may have heard of called Social Bite. That's been a real um, interesting lens to look through because I've been able to see homelessness from all different areas. So are you aware that we do food deliveries? We have a restaurant. We also have um, employment programs and housing programs that's, that's been launched. Um, we have cafes. A lot of people are aware of our cafes, and we serve um, free food to our homeless community, those who are destitute, and those who are in food poverty. And what I'd like to, to say is, I work with some incredible colleagues, um, from those who serve food in the cafes, right through to our board. Everybody in the forefront of their brains, in the forefront, is wanting to end homelessness, and that's a massive motivator. So everybody is courageous that I work with, everybody's compassionate and brave, and dedicated to, to you know, really get behind the cause. And we do a lot of fundraising campaigns, you might be aware of that as well, or Sleep in the Park, or We Sleep Out for Young People, it is on campaign. But essentially, you know, we work really hard to try and make a difference. And a lot of the time we don't know what the destination is, but we take a leap of faith and the aim is to, to make a difference. The point I'd really like to make is whether you live in Kansas, whether you live in Scotland or anywhere in the world, this is a state of emergency. Homelessness and not having a roof over your head is a state of emergency. This is a human rights issue. Everybody should have a roof over their head. I want to look at some of the characters that I've met on, on my way, especially working at Social Bite. <coughs> um, so I want to look at these characters through my eyes and, and how I work. So I want to introduce Dorothy. She's sort of the lead character. So Dorothy, in my world, I met her last year in Glasgow. And she had found herself in Scotland, completely displaced, didn't know anybody, and it was sometimes hostile. It wasn't that welcoming. And I'm from Scotland, and, and I really love her. I love Scotland. Scotland's my home. And I could not imagine feeling displaced. How would you all feel? Now, Tin Man, he's my favorite character. Um, I met Tin Man about four years ago at Social Bite, and um, 
Tin Man to me is a, a modern day robot. Now, I'm always terrified whenever I watch films about robots and artificial intelligence because I think of Terminator 2 or iRobot, and it's quite scary. But we need not be scared of <coughs> robots and artificial intelligence. I'm quite excited about it. So the way I get around it is thinking of Tin Man being that. But Tin Man, to me, is someone, as I say, I met four years ago. And he was a really interesting character. He would pop into the shops for free food but he would also forage in the bins outside. And he had an overgrown beard, and you, you could hardly see his face, it was really obscured. He was stuck, really hollow, and he was such a great thinker, though. So he had all these brains, but he'd lost heart. He'd lost heart somewhere along the way. So one of the staff offered him a job and says, you know, do you want to do some KP and work in the kitchen? And he says, yeah, I, th I think I can do that. Now, he had a lot of sick time, and we made allowance for that. So he'd have weeks off, he'd be in, in bouts of depression. And, but he was such a clever man, such a clever guy. But he had a lot of loss issues, and he, he really hated endings, because every ending that he had was really negative. And once we all got to know him, and he started building trust in the relationships and social bite, and he was accepted, I discovered that he had dropped out of a university in Glasgow. So after a bit of persuasion, and after he sort of trusted the team, he decided, you know, maybe, maybe there's a possibility of me going back and finishing. Now, given this guy's no very good with endings. So after I wrote a few letters and spoke on the phone, he managed to um, get back into university and finish his course. And, you know, it was such an amazing experience at Social Bite when he got his PhD and he became a doctor. So, you know, I, I still feel emotional about that because, you know, it was such a massive achievement for him. And then to see all the staff, you know, just really excited for what now for him. So he's moved on and he, he'll always have a place in my heart. So that's who I like to think Tin Man is. Maybe there's a Tin Man that you know out there that you can relate to and hopefully you'll reach out to them. I'm going to move on to Scarecrow now. Scarecrow... I met Scarecrow um, a few years ago, and he lives in a place in Edinburgh called Circus Lane. And he's got learning difficulties. And he's got real social anxieties. He doesn't like being around people. He's quite awkward, but he's quite funny as well. I always feel entertained whenever I'm, I'm with him, and he's quite innocent. He sees the world quite innocently. But like Scarecrow, he's had the stuffing knock out of him a few times. He's been taken advantage of. And do you know what? He'd give you his last. Every time I've seen him, he's like, oh, you know, I've got, I've got some cigarettes or is there anything you need? And, you know, this guy's got nothing. He's got absolutely nothing. And, you know, there's reasons why people live on the streets, are rough sleepers. And there's many reasons. And I just want you to think of my scarecrow because he would never dream of going in a hostel or a night shelter because he just can't deal with the people round about him. So think about that whenever you pass a scarecrow in the street that's rough sleeping, that maybe there's something going on underneath. And do you know what his biggest fear is? Because he lives in a tent, and his biggest fear is it gets burnt because he's heard stories, and people have told him that there's been media things and, and people's tents go on fire. And actually, it's the truth that has happened and people have been sleeping, and their tents have been set on fire when they're in them. So I just want you to think about Scarecrow crow for a wee minute. The lion. Now, I want to talk about the lion from when I worked at the drug court. I was a counsellor um, in the Kingdom of Fife, um, in the drug court. And that was really interesting. It was a very different setting. And um, there was a man that I was working with, and I'd say, I'd say he's about 50 and um, there was a floating sheriff that day. Usually it's the drug court sheriffs, it's the same one, but it was a different sheriff that was on that day. And the lion approached the court and he found out, found out who, who the sheriff was and he could have walked away. I mean, he was so used to walking away and out of court. He'd been in prison so many times in and out. And he seen the name and he recognised the name and he stayed. And for me, the, the, the point I want to make... Will, with Lion Man, you know, he had a lot of adverse childhood experiences. This guy had lost his pride. 
he had the scars, knuckles damaged to the fighting that he had done. But there was a child in him. There was a child in him that he was suppressing and keeping down. And he would use substances to, to keep some of these traumas at bay. And it just wasn't working. But the remarkable thing <clears throat> about what happened that day in court stays with me. He had a lawyer that fought for him hammer and tooth and that really believed in him. And the lion really respected his lawyer and trusted him. And in court, the sheriff comes through. Now, lion has got an unusual name, and I just assumed that the sheriff might have known him from way back with this unusual name, but the sheriff knew him. And there was just that moment in court where both of them make eye contact. It wasn't staring, but it was just a moment of knowing an acknowledgement without any words. And that caught me unaware, didn't expect it. It's a courtroom. And it's sometimes quite hostile. It's not the friendly places to be. And I'm standing there thinking, you know, is he going to get sent away today? I, think, I really think he is. And the sheriff looked at him and he, he says, I know you. I know you from 10 years ago. This sheriff had presided on a case 10 years earlier. And it was a child abuse case that this lion was given evidence on. And that sheriff remembered him. And that was important for the lion to be acknowledged and remembered. And the sheriff just turned around to him and said, you know what you need to do. You know what you need to look at. I know why you're here and you continue to be here. I hope it's time for you to look at this. And that was just amazing. And that changed that changed just like that, the course of the action that followed from seeing the sheriff that day. And he got the courage and he moved on and he's not been back at court and I'm so proud of the line. Now I want to think about right now, I'm just thinking, right, okay, let's look at your journey. Would you walk along your path with a scarecrow, with a tin man, Dorothy, and the line, I don't think so. I don't think you'll walk along them on your, your life path. But if we turned it around a wee bit, and it was my lion that I've experienced, my tin man, my Dorothy, my scarecrow, would you? Maybe indirectly, I think you would. Possibly you would reach out to them. But if I was to say to you, would you like courage? Would you like a heart? Would you like intelligence on your journey? Of course you would. Of course you would. I would, and certainly the guys that I know would. Now, I'm going to take you to Edinburgh at this point because I was walking along a few weeks ago and I discovered that the, art, um, the artist for The Wizard of Oz who um, painted a lot of the scenes, you know, te Technicolor was just being launched at this point. And um, when you, you imagine back then, this was groundbreaking. So this man um, had went to a college in Glasgow and qualified at the art college, but he was born in Edinburgh in 1904, and then he went over to America in the 1930s. But where he lived was on um, Spittle Junction, just beside Bread Street, and I've got a photo depicting this. So I stood where his flat would be, and I looked out, and i just seen this amazing big road, and the view that he had to the castle. And I just wondered if that inspired him um, because he painted the iconic scene where Dorothy first looks at the Emerald City. And you know, it just made me think. And then when I was there a few weeks ago, I'm looking and I, I, and at the, the left-hand side, sorry, the right-hand side, my right, what you see now is an access practice on that street. And that's where a lot of your homeless guys go for medical treatment, or those um, that just aren't registered with a GP. They have an HIV clinic there, a sexual health clinic, um, all sorts of things go in there. And then further up again, there's Codebase, and that's an incubator for the tech industry in Scotland. So it's very different um, the, way, the way it is, is now. So uh, there's another building that I really love, and that's down in Brighton. And I want to tell you a wee bit about Brighton. I've been back and forward there for many years. My brother worked down there. And when I f first went down there in the 90s, there was a lot of Scottish people that were homeless on the streets. So I used to go down with crates of iron brew and tablet and macaroon and hand into the hostel. Um, 
But, you know, there's a lot of people flock to Brighton. Um, or those who are homeless in London maybe come out to Brighton. But this building, I absolutely love it. It's just incredible. It's a real blend of east and west. It's, it's, it's lovely. It's out in the gardens. But there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of rough sleepers sleep in those gardens. Now, one of my friends down in Brighton decend- decided to send me a film. Um, not like The Wizard of Oz, far from it. It was actually CCTV footage f- from down in Brighton. And what I seen on the footage really shocked me. It really, really got to me. There's two characters. One is a rough sleeper, and one is a man, and he's wearing a T-shirt and shorts and flip-flops, and it's a hot summer's night last August. <clears throat> and what got me in the video was a man in the shorts and T-shirts and flip-flops casually walks up to the man that's rough sleeping, so the rough sleeper set up his bed for the night and he's sleeping and he walks up and he's got a paving stone and then he just knocks him four times on the head with the paving stone and sadly the rough sleeper later died. And in court the man showed no remorse. He didn't even say why. It just happened. So the case was just say four weeks ago and he's now in prison for murder. And it's interesting because from that, it's really activated the people down in Brighton to get more proactive around some of the social problems that are down there. Who's on the streets? How can we help? So the newspapers are now filled with a lot of things around some of the deprivation that's happening there. And you know, it's very sad that it takes a death for that to happen, but many times, because deaths within the homeless community are not really officially recorded. Mainly it's the newspapers that we find out that information. I'd also like to say that, you know, on my journey, as well as meeting incredible people, I've, you know, had the privilege of um, spending a lot of time with people that work with us that have come from the homeless community. And there's some incredible stories, and I can't share that all with you today. I just thought I'd give you a snippet. But going forward, you know, I'd like you all to always have a home, that you don't have the trauma of being homeless and have that experience. And I hope that you find empathy. I hope you find courage when you look at some social issues, because we're bombarded with images every day. I mean, I'm flicking through my social media, and I'm going up and down, up and down. If it's not a dog that's getting rescued from a burning fire, and I'm in tears, then it's something else. And, you know, it gets our emotions going up and down. And a lot of times I respond to a lot of the social issues and, 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 and follow a lot of things. But what I'm going to say to you is, in life, what we need for us as humans It's not the artificial intelligence. That'll take care of itself. What we all need is emotional intelligence. It's so, so important. And even I'm trying to manage that because I get so emotional at times when I see so many images. But I would like for you, for every dream that you do have, for it to really come true. Thank you very much. Thank you.